Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Lemon Russ. It never troubles the wolf how many the sheep may be. Throw me to the wolves and I will return, leading the pack. Wrestle me arm and your spine shall implode. Were you looking for the tank named after yours truly? Lemon Russ, the Great Wolf, the Lord of Winter and Ruin, and Wolf King of Fenris, also known as Lemon Russ, Lemon Rust, and that fucking furry, not to be confused with the tank bearing his name, is the Primarch of the Space Wolves Legion. A superhuman Nordic king with a warrior's crude humor and a stubborn streak a mile wide. He was such a hard-headed son of a bitch, that he survived extended fights with Angron. Magnus, the Lion, Horus and even the Emperor himself. General all around bad as deserving of much respect, but superstitious and flawed, with a serious problem valuing others points of view, even if he understood them. He's blonde underneath all the blood. There appears to be no specific way to pronounce his surname as both the wider Imperium and the wolves themselves commonly alternate between RUHSS and RHOOs when speaking about him or the battle tank named after him. Origins. When the Primarchs were lost, Lemon's capsule landed on Fenris, a harsh planet of insane violence that the Norse gods shit out after a three-day meth-fueled orgy with a tyrannid hive fleet. The locals there enjoy a life of fishing, drinking, sailing, fucking, pillaging, and conquering other tribes of people for the modest little islands they all have to live on. Granted, it's also usually a very short life, because they are sharing the world with trolls, Yet is wolves the size of horses, wolves the size of battle tanks, bears the size of a house, whales that kill for fun, and krakens, which are to a squid as a high elephant is to a homer gaunt. So it was that little baby Russ left his capsule in the polar mountain region of Asahim. There, some monstrous female wolf found him and said to herself I want. So Russ was raised by a dire wolf and spiss, Google Romulus and Remus for a real life version. A few years pass, Russ growing up big and strong and hairy, having a grand old time running around the mountains and killing the sheep and such of the humans there with his wolf brothers. Eventually a king named Thenga heard of the wolf man, and decreed he be captured and brought to his hall. The Mr. Ages, and Redkins, have hidden the details of Thenga's first meeting with Russ. Some stories would say that Russ was bound and gagged and dragged into the hall of the King Thenga after his wolf family was slain, others claim a hunting party stumbled across his cave and kicked off a bloody melee in which a dozen hunters were killed, along with Russ's mother, after which the hunters realized they weren't fighting a wolf, they were probably drunk and kind of retarded, and somehow convinced Russ to stand down and come with them, a conversation that may or may not have included copious amounts of alcohol and whores. Thengler took a wondrous interest in Russ and ordered he be educated. In a short time, Russ was trash-talking every short bastard who dared look at him the wrong way, and had become insanely good with weaponry. When Thengler finally died, all declared that Lemon of the Russ become the new High King. Also, remember that Volsung Saga quote regarding warrior initiations for berserks? Considering that, according to old fluff, Sanguinius looked like a young teen adult at one year old. Lemon Russ passed this trial that when he was around 7-10 months old or so. No wonder he went on to be a dick with some of his brothers and his new recruits. First, the space wolves feed them like they arrived to Valhalla and then, throw em in a thunderhawk and kick em into them in the cold wilderness of Fenris until they transform into Wolfen or return home by themselves. Comorant was easily manipulated by the lunar wolf Primarch and tearing a new assault to Magnus. The next step. Russ conquered and took. He bartered and traded. He united the people of Asalim under his rule. Somehow, the Emperor heard of it and realized it all had to be the work of a Primarch. So then he attended a royal banquet in the Hall of the Mountain Key I mean Lemon Russ. The Emperor, taking a leaf out of Odin's book, disguised himself as some old geezer, then waited until the right moments to reveal his true identity. When he did Russ refused to bow down and challenge him to several contests, he ate so much the Emperor was forced to back down. Russ drank so much the Emperor was forced to back down. 
By now, the Emperor was fairly surprised at finally being outdone by someone else. Russ gazed upon the Emperor and challenged him in combat. And so did the Emperor raise his power glove into the air for all to see. And so did he then bring it down on Lemon Russ's head. Knocking him the fuck out in one solid hit. Of course fluff changes and a one hit KO wasn't very fulfilling. So the new lore arrived. After the Emperor revealed himself Lemon Russ skipped the eating and drinking contests and just challenged the Emperor to a fight. It is unknown whether the Emperor was in his full armor and actually had his power fist at the time, or whether he used his psychic powers, but the duel lasted for hours. Presumably Russ did a lot better this time by virtue of not being drunk. Comma in the end, though the Emperor, presumably pissy that Lemon was waving his cock in his face by just straight up fighting him, punched him square in the face and dropped him. When Russ awoke, he laughed it off and swore loyalty to the one who managed to beat him. Afterwards he ended up in command of the one space marine legion that knows how to eat, drink, brawl and make war upon any arsehole that mocks their thunder wolf. Rumor has it that the Emp was so pleased with Russ' prowess that he tasked him and the space wolves to be his executioners and it seems Russ is the reason the 2nd and 11th legions no longer exist. So he has experience fucking up a Primarch, which is pretty goddamn manly. Not confirmed by any sources and is not more than passing conversation in one black library novel. Other than that, yeah totally definitely didn't kill the other legions. Also if you take how he acted with Angren and Magnus, he totally hated his job of being the executioner. And apparently thought Logger was a pretty cool guy. The novel Betrayer gives Angren's version of their run-in, where he tells to Logger what happened. Russ had taken it upon himself to school the world eaters as he was disgusted by their behavior. Anglin was having none of Russ's babbling and picked a fight with him by insulting the big. E. Anglin eventually defeats Russ in single combat, but because only he was fighting to kill while Russ was trying to teach. It then ends with the Space Wolves entirely outmaneuvering the eaters and winning a tactical victory by surrounding Anglin, some more hissing vitriol between the two Primarchs and Anglin leaving. The World Eaters believe they won due to a higher kill count and the Wolves leave disappointed that their Legion brothers were too retarded to see the lesson Russ was teaching. It is pretty telling that even Lorga replies to England that he was a complete tool on that night and would have been killed after hearing him boast of how he won against Russ. With that said, Lorga was able to get Angren to learn the lesson Russ was trying to teach him by just talking to him for 2 minutes. And he did it without getting a shitload of his own men killed or getting his ass kicked in a duel. Not only does it show just how badly Russ failed at what he had set out to do on the Night of the Wolf, but also how his own hot-headedness and fundamental inability to understand his brothers can royally bite him in the ass. Close bracket. Apart from that, Russ and his space wolves had a goddamn good time during the Great Crusade, although it hasn't been written about so this is all we can guess. Until Inferno dropped. It turns out that Russ became the Emperor's executioner in the process of fighting the Rangdon Xenocytes, which saw entire army regiments, Titan Legions and, redacted, Space Marine Legions, could be chapters, could actually be entire legions, wiped out. With the Lunar Wolves up to the eyes in glorious warfare in the Galactic East, Russ and the VI headed north along with the I Legion. This is the war that ended the I's time as the largest legion. The end of the Xenocytes entailed a series of biopogroms which left the wolves with a very ugly reputation, and from then on Russ' role was the doer of necessary dirty deeds. Burning of Prospero and the Horus Heresy. When that bitch ass Horus started whining and crying, Lemon Russ and his legion were on their way to Prospero to bring Magnus the Red to Terra for questioning. Horus intercepted the message and reworded it to order Russ to destroy Magnus and his thousand sons. And interestingly Russ found when they arrived at Prospero he didn't want to do that. He decided to go against the orders he thought were legit, and instead detain him and his legion so that they could be transported to Terra, ironically doing exactly what his legit orders were by going against what he thought they were, but when Magnus refused to answer the phone and the thousand sons calls were all being blocked by the Primarch, and by a siege demon in disguise, he became more and more annoyed. And eventually he was pissed off enough that he and the Space Wolves carried out a class 10 cluster for King on Prospero, aided along a bit by Magnus himself lowering his planet's defenses because he wanted to atone for his wrongdoings in the dumbest fucking way possible. 
It should have ended with the glorious finale where Lemon Russ himself lifted Magnus the Red over his shoulders and broke the sorcerer's back over his knee. Rumor has it that Russ could be heard shouting ah yes. I was wondering what would break first, your spirit, or your body. Dot. Turns out it was both at the same time. Dot. But even so, the red bastard managed to utter one single word of power and escape through the fucking ground. Russ was so enraged that he ordered the 13th company of space wolves to pursue the fleeing thousand suns through their pansy ass portals. Though Russ lost his duel with Magnus. The red giant gained the upper hand and was going to kill Russ had his two wolf pets not intervene and distracted Magnus enough for Russ to counter attack and win. 3 vs 1. Pathetic. Only Korax, Dawn and Lion were able to beat traitor Primarchs on their own during the heresy. Previous author evidently forgot about Russ beating post Moloch Horus himself and only not killing him due to hesitating twice. This said, winning the Battle of Prospero left a bitter taste in Russ' mouth and complicated things for the wolves in the long run. First of all, despite his reputation as the Emperor's executioner, fighting Magnus took a serious toll on Russ. Rumor has it that during the battle between those two demigods Magnus, by psychic means, laid his heart and mind bare to Russ, revealing that he knew not only every blow that was coming from his brother, but everything that he had come to know, accepting his failure and his fate, which was defeat. In the recently published Horus Heresy novel Wolfsbane Magnus' last words to Russ are finally revealed you are a sword in the wrong hands. You have severed an innocent neck. In other words, Magnus was even aware that the wolves had been manipulated into wiping the thousand suns out, instead of detaining them and bringing them back to terror, but not aware he wasn't actually innocent, and the idiot just let it happen instead of talking to Russ who wanted to ignore his orders and detain the suns, in order to bring them back to terror. It will be interesting to see how GW tries to fill the logic gap regarding the hatred of Magnus towards the wolves now, considering he obviously knew that Russ had been manipulated into killing Magnus and the entirety of the burning of Prospero is directly his fault. One easy way out would be the loss of the shard of Magnus that held his nobility which was absorbed by Arnus, first Grandmaster of the Grey Knights. A former thousand son that was in the process of succumbing to the flesh change when this little accident occurred, but most fans would prefer a more convincing explanation. Seeing a hyper genius like Magnus hating the space wolves for destroying his legion, irrespective of the fact that he knew that they had been manipulated into doing so and the fact that he intentionally chose for his legion to be destroyed, makes less sense with Magnus added layer of remorse and self awareness. Then again, said hyper genius. Even at his best and most complete, had a monumental know-it-all complex, a lot of pride in his life's work, and a long history of mutual scorn with Russ. That, plus the fact that Primarchs are not known for making rational and empathic decisions with one another, might help explain some of it. Either way, the events of Prospero shook the Wolf King deeply, but Russ decided to carry on and try to make the best of a real clusterfuck of a situation. An inquisitor once called it an emo phase in front of a ruined priest, and was fed balls first to a thunder wolf. Comma not long after that, the news of the drop site massacre reached the wolves, which was another blow for the wolf king. In his own words, Russ felt he'd been in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing, wasting his time and men fighting an eventually futile battle instead of standing with his brother Primarchs against the real threat. Just to make things worse. The Alpha Legion turned up to batter the wolves and prevent them from heading to terror and helping Big E. As the rotten cherry on top of an already really bad cake, the White Scars, who'd been bros with the Thousand Sons and had no idea why Ross had just decided to fuck them up royally seemingly out of the blue, were going to help them after Prospero. But the Dark Angels of all people aided the wolves in fighting off the Alpha Legion, letting the wolves damage their fleet to an impressive degree. A plus here was that Bjorn the Fell Handed came to his attention, setting the young warrior on the path to ironclad badassness. This said, when he went to Yeren to fight the main traitor advance, Russ was badly injured, entering a coma and giving Bjorn temporary command of the Legion. He bought Dawn and the Emperor more time, but didn't make it back to Terra until it was too late. Oh and MP totally gave him a spear after most of the Terran members of his original legion died fighting various scribbly Xenos. Including Tyranids. Yup. 
Said spear was tossed into a certain demon Primarch single eye, thereby preventing him from manifesting in reality and resurrecting his legion. Rust totally hated this spear BTW. At one point Rust tried to hit a moon orbiting some planet, he was drunk, don't judge, and the spear was lost for months but since it had been a gift from Big. Either Wolves did spend said months searching for it. In the novel Wolfsbane and the short story Two Metaphysical Blades, it's revealed he was secretly fearful of the spear and purposefully avoided using it while claiming he was a short-range fighter that preferred swords and axes, forgetting it at conferences before people brought it back. He later uses it and became fond of it as a weapon after a trip into the warp revealed its intended purpose in parallel with his role. Later he uses said spear to fight chaos-empowered Horus, after another try to get rid of it. He manages to stop the War Master with it, but then he acts like a fucking idiot. Instead of just killing Horus and ending the rebellion then and there, he tries to reach out to Horus' good side and gets fucked up because of it. Funny thing, that spear. It's actually the twin of another spear, the Apollonian spear, wielded by the commander of the Custodes, Constantin Valda. Russ's spear is known by many names, including Gungnik, the Spear of Odin, simply the Spear of Russ and others. But, this spear and its twin were both crafted by Biggie and infused with parts of his psychic insight, so before any of those other names it was called the Dionysian Spear. Now, this is a bit of a deep cut on GW's part, but the Apollonian and Dionysian actually refers to the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, feeling lost yet? Comma who was in turn writing about the Greek gods Apollo and Dionysus. In Nietzsche's philosophy, the Apollonian is representative of everything bright and individual, meaning life and the person living it, as well as order and stability. The Dionysian, however, is representative of the primordial state from which all things originally emerge, the chaotic nothingness from which the individual Apollonian springs forth. So, bringing it back to 40k, the Apollonian spear of Constantin Valda can impart the memories of the person it kills to its wielder. Capturing that individual and orderly moment. When inquired by Valder, the Emperor intended it to be a tool to make Valder understand his foes and as a check to keep him from getting too arrogant. What does Russ's spear, the Dionysian spear do? Well, we really don't know, but if the novel Wolfsbane is anything to go by, it seems that at least a couple people believe it's the weapon best suited for killing a Primarch. As seen with how the spear stabbed Russ and showed him how horrifying the truth of the Primarch's origins were and how it erased all the corruption temporarily from Horus' mind, it's certainly a potent and terrifying weapon. And since the Primarchs are essentially the Emperor's own demonkin, it stands to reason that the Dionysian spear was designed by the Emperor to destroy the soul of the Primarchs and return them to the primal chaos from which they originated. This in turn gives with Russ's word of being the Emperor's executioner. Russ and his brothers. In many ways Russ can be best understood by looking at the clashes between him and his brothers, butting heads with Angron, Magnus, and Lionel Jensen over the years. All three of them had much in common with Russ, and there was potential for great brotherhood there, but in large part his lack of tact or understanding crushed whatever relationship might have been. His fight with Angron was an attempt to teach his brother a lesson. Both of them were consummate warriors, both relied on their amazing athleticism and berserker rages to triumph in battle, both were known for losing their temper when challenged, but Russ saw weakness in his brother's lack of strategy. Lemon tried to just talk to the world eaters Primarch, but Angron was so uncontrollably, incredibly, calm down son, angry that he just attacked Russ. While Russ and Angron were dueling, their retinues kicked off an open war. And in the battle that followed Russ found himself defeated by Angron, but Angron was in turn outmaneuvered and surrounded by the Space Wolves, thus proving Russ's lesson that warrior prowess isn't enough. That said, no one learned anything. Angron thought himself the victor because he'd won the duel and his sons had inflicted greater casualties than the Wolves, but Russ thought himself the victor because he'd proven his point and educated his brother. On the flip side. Arguments that Russ should have been more tactful ignore that he was trying to deal with a space marine legion of questionable loyalty that could and had caused massive amounts of collateral damage. There's a time for caution, it's not when rampaging super soldiers are threatening the Imperium and its people. Which is indeed a good point, but then he should have gone all the way and gotten big. 
E's approval to deal with this shit once and for all if it came down to that instead of trying to do things on his own on the sly. No matter how you look at it, Russ idea to educate his brother was one of good intent. No really, it's a genuine bro move that the Primarchs rarely extended to another, but of poor execution. If Russ had paid more attention and thought things through rather than sticking to do things his way, he'd have used subtler methods of persuasion to calm Angron, as Fulgrim and especially Lorga had done in the past. Russ would have had an easier time of persuading Angron than either of them, given that he and Angron had a similar sense of brutal honor and a great lust for war. But, ultimately, it didn't occur to Russ to slow down and think his idea though, so he failed that day. Well, that last statement is a bit in the gray zone. It was rightfully pointed out above that Russ was not exactly cool-headed either. And it was only when Angron said that without the nails he might have been a more honorable man, like Russ claimed to be, but that if this were so he might have decided at some point to storm the Emperor's palace and chop the slavering bastard's head off. That was the final straw for Russ who couldn't take more of that shit, hissed heretic as he lost his temper and things went downhill from there until both legions clashed. It is also noteworthy, and of course grim.tragic, that Angron made some pretty valid and surprisingly logical arguments including showing genuine regret for having been pressed into a role he had never wanted, I died on Nuceria, especially considering what a berserk killer he was even then already. Several years brain hemorrhages later only the berserk killer with the attention span of a two year old was left but that's a story for another day, as in, when he was trolling Ultramar with Lorga, which ultimately culminated in his ascension to demon, prince, hood. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Russ really, really didn't get along with Magnus, even before the burning of Prospero. He hated that his brother used sorcery and warp craft so extensively. The rune priests of the Space Wolves use their cyclic abilities in a much more limited and controlled way than the Thousand Suns, and the Rout never used Chaos Familiars, which the Thousand Suns, to be fair, were totally unaware of using. They thought them to be benevolent spirits or tutelaries. Until the burning of Prospero of course when these spirits showed their true colors and turned on Magnus Sons. The wolves also use the spirits of Fenris, hence all the totems and runes. Nearly all fluff indicates that this is utter horseshit, until the spirit of Fenris was revealed to be real. Russ convictions led him to feud with Magnus, but so did his concerns over the threat the XVTH Legion posed to the Imperium and his frustration with Magnus' tendency to abandon his allies in favor of investigating some psychic artifact or slow down a conquest to avoid damaging some books. Russ never stopped to consider that Magnus' understanding of the warp might have been better than his, or that the things Magnus preserved might have value for the humans Russ wanted to make the galaxy safe for. Ridiculous theories that Russ was a sicker aside. Another significant source of the feud between Magnus and Russ was the Crimson King's sheer arrogance. Lemon Russ was rightly proud of his cunning battle tactics and personal ferocity, and was fully aware that he grew up on a savage death world where everything is constantly trying to kill you, while Magnus had it comparatively easy on Prospero. The Wolf King and his legion, from the Wheel of Fire to the Rangdon Xenocytes, had proved its metal, cunning, and devotion to the Emperor many times over, yet Magnus treated him like a dumb hick and acted as though his psychic powers made him the greatest Primarch. It couldn't have helped matters that some of the threats the Vith had bested were psychic in nature. Yet Magnus knew none of this, only the Emperor and the Space Wolves understood the extent of the threats they had faced down. Russ never considered that Magnus had no knowledge of the terrible secrets that only he had been entrusted with, he expected Magnus to take the word of an ignorant savage that the abilities he defined himself by couldn't be trusted. 
Whether Magnus would have listened if he did explain all that on the other hand, is another story. Recall that he didn't listen the first time the Emperor told him to stop. Perhaps most famous and most tragic of Russ's feuds was his strife with Lionel Jensen. Both men had very similar origins, but slight differences in their upbringings drove a wedge between them. The wolf and the lion were both raised by the wild, both of their pods had crashed in areas with no humans, and they had to learn to survive with no lessons from other men. Both were eventually taken in when they were discovered by the men of their world, but that's where their stories differ. Where Russ was raised in the friendly, bawdy brotherhood of Fenger's men, the lion was trained and educated in the somber fraternity of the knightly order. While Russ had been brawling and singing with his friends, leading great hunts to destroy monsters and enemy tribes, the lion was mastering discipline and embarking on solemn quests to destroy the great beasts of the forest. The battle between the two came on the world of Dulan, where the VI and IST Legion were fighting together to slay a tyrant who'd insulted Russ's honor. At the beginning of the conflict the two brothers had promised to work together, but as time went on the lion grew tired of his brother's insistence on utterly smashing every pocket of resistance rather than taking a more efficient, direct method of ending the war. Eventually he just launched an assault on the tyrant's palace, and beheaded the man before Russ could reach them. In the heat of the moment, Russ was furious to hear that and immediately confronted his brother. Russ was an angry dickhead, the lion was a snarky bastard, and before long blades were drawn and the two were trying to kill each other in a violent battle. After a long and bloody fight in which the two of them beat one another senseless and finally fell over the ramparts of the fortress to the ground below, Russ started laughing, the ridiculousness of what they were doing finally apparent. Here they were. Two Primarchs of the Legion's Astartes, brawling like children instead of leading their men. The lion, however, didn't laugh. Like, at all. He coldly asked if his brother would yield, a question that just confused Russ. His brother thought this was a real duel? Russ had thought of the fight as a brawl between angry brothers like would happen on Fenris, a quick spat that would end with both of them beaten and bloodied, a spur of the moment thing to vent their anger they'd laugh about over a tankard of mjod years later. The lion however was taking it deadly seriously and while Russ was laughing he struck a final blow, shattering Russ's skull and ending the fight. Had Russ stopped to consider his brother's mentality, or listened more closely to the lion's words, he would have realized that the lion saw the conflict as something profoundly different from what Russ thought it was, taking the matter of honor as something deadly serious. Again, Russ's lack of consideration was his failing. However, while certainly abrasive, arrogant, and brutal, Russ was also every bit as loyal as Sanguinius or Dawn. The other thing Magnus, Angron, and the lion had in common? All three of them behaved like assholes in their way. The lion had zero people skills, arrogantly considered himself the best of all Primarchs, acted like he was some prince in waiting and lorded it over his brothers, him turning a small brawl into a duel of honor case in point. Magnus was much more enjoyable to be around but he arrogantly assumed he knew best because of his powers and blatantly favored sickers in his legion. Anglin's cases. Self-explanatory. Bottom line, his brothers all put their own feelings goals before those of the Emperor. Not to say that Russ was tactful, diplomatic, or understanding with these three, he certainly could have handled all of these conflicts better, but Russ was never a dick just for the sake of being a dick, he was a dick because someone had to keep his brothers in line. His relationships with his brothers also highlight another one of his traits. Fans love to call him a hypocrite, and this isn't far off the mark. However, it's not quite on target either. To elaborate, Russ did indeed criticize, and at times even physically attacked, his brothers for Tracy or his legion also had. On closer inspection, though, the way Russ dealt with his flaws was different from his brothers, and that's the best justification for his behavior. Russ and Angron both led legions that were extremely violent, especially towards the defenseless. But Russ made a point from the very beginning to rein himself in and taught his legion to temper their bloodlust and fight to make the galaxy safe for humans by example. Angron didn't care about either his legion or the people of the Imperium. The only leadership and example he gave the world eaters was to slaughter anything that dared stand in his way. Even worse, Angron jammed the butcher's nails in the brains of his warhounds. 
taking their discipline and brotherhood away from them and leaving them to degenerate into blood crazed psychopathic super soldiers living only to kill without rhyme or reason. Russ gave massacres of friendly units as his main reason for intervening. As for Johnson, both Primarchs had an element of glory seeking in their nature. Both were also very stubborn and combative, with an animalistic side. However, Russ wasn't ruled by his pride but his drive to serve the Emperor came from a different place. The Lion lectured Russ about wasting time destroying the Emperor's enemies, when winning wars is all that matters. Ironically a similar lesson that Russ tried to teach Engram, while Russ couldn't countenance leaving any enemies alive. During a dispute between the Space Wolves and the Dark Angels over a friendly fire incident, Russ personally apologized to the Lion in spite of the Dark Angels being the ones who knowingly fired on the route. Russ put aside his lust for glory and victory to save the lives of his men, then privately made it clear what would happen should the Dark Angels do something similar again. By contrast, the Lion's honor was everything to him, that the Dark Angels fired on the route because they had been fired on first, even after warnings were given, and that the Lion seemed fully prepared to kill his brother and the brawl over kill stealing, because Russ laid hands on him first. This distinction justifies Russ' initial hatred of Johnson though the two did come to an understanding later that the reason for the lion breaking his promise on Dulin was because Russ was putting off the final blow and allowing the battle to drag out, costing lives, which was pretty much the lesson Johnson was trying to point out earlier. All because Russ had wandered off the battle plan to sort out the Walfen issue within the 13th company, something that Russ later realized that the lion already knew and had quietly disposed of the evidence for his brother, even though he could have used the knowledge to break the Space Wolves Legion. With Magnus, the accusations of hypocrisy carry little weight. Russ attempts to cover up the curse of the Walfen are somewhat similar to Magnus' treatment of the flesh change. The Walfen curse was not exacerbated by rampant sorceress power use like the flesh change was, and both legions did use sickers. The real difference here is how they dealt with the situation. However, the rune priests were much more cautious than the sorcerers of the Thousand Suns in their dealings with the Empyrean and only taking a sip of the cup when needed instead of drinking deep each time as the Khan would put it. More importantly, the Space Wolves treat the degeneration of their gene seed and the transformation into Wolfen as a curse, a failing to be contained and if possible eradicated. The Thousand Suns treat their sicker powers as a badge of superiority, taking any excuse to use them and reveling in what made them unique without considering its links with the flesh change. Russ did his best to control his secrets, he didn't glorify them or thought it made him and his wolves better than the other legions. Magnus was controlled by his secrets and saw them as strengths. It's also worth noting that as per Prospero Burns Cinti and Dickory had led Russ and others to believe Magnus Equerry had planted a spy among the wolves, with Ammon apparently attacking Bjorn and a custodian at Nikia. It is a tragic turn of events in its own right that this Ammon was in truth a demon masquerading as the Ammon, who had, matter of factly, faithfully stayed at Magnus' side which was generously entirely disregarded by both the wolves and the custodians for plot reasons, playing a pivotal role in tipping the balance towards the dissolution of the Librarius, which, ironically, would have been one of the greatest assets the Imperium the Emperor would have been able to field against chaos during the heresy. Just as planned. Dot. TL. DR. Russ shared many flaws with his brothers, but he was defined by being in control rather than being thralled to his flaws. His bloodlust never overtook his discipline like it would Angren. His glory seeking never overrode his sense of responsibility like it would Lionel Jensen. He made sure his sons worked against their curse rather than have them embrace it like Magnus did. It comes to no surprise that someone who worked so hard for control resented people who thought they didn't need it. Hence the accusations of hypocrisy, however, in fairness like many of his brother's primarchs, interpersonal skills weren't exactly his forte. Russ' real failing was not that he accused others for things he had to deal with himself, but rather that he was in a unique position where he could have been an example to his brothers because he shared and knew how to deal with said flaws but his brashness and aggressivity drove them apart instead. On a somewhat amusing tangent. Russ considered Rob out Gilliman a good choice for Warmaster, and in return Gilliman considered Russ and his legion part of his dauntless few, meaning that Bobby G sincerely believed that alongside Russ and his wolves, the Ultramarines could defeat any opponent. 
rather amusingly, when he was struck down by Fulgrim. Gilliman's last thoughts were, in order, of his sons, of the Imperium, and then for his brothers, the first being Russ. While they weren't exactly best of buds, Russ actually believed Gilliman and Perturabo were the most boring among his brothers after Rogal Dawn. They had a sincere respect for each other as warriors. The only thing they had a bit of a pickle with was Rob's Codex Starts thing, and Russ eventually ostensibly acquiesced only to ignore it when G-Man stopped breathing down his neck. Kinda. The Space Wolves did try to form a successor chapter, the Wolf Brothers, but those very quickly devolved into Wolf and for whatever reason, it is suspected the planet Fenris has something to do with it. Post Heresy. Although unable to return to aid the Imperium in the battle for Terra, Russ and the Space Wolves threw themselves headfirst into the post Heresy war efforts. Aside from spanking the traitors into the Eye of Terra, he came up with the concept for the Adeptus Parises. Though he'd told Gilliman where he could shove his codex, Russ liked the idea of successor chapters for the wolves. To him, or the little reformist movement within the Legion later, the fluff isn't totally clear, they were a way of maintaining the wolves' influence alongside that of Joe Lehman, Dawn and the rest. Unfortunately the wolves' gene seed proved too unstable to set up any viable successor chapters, and as a result while the Ultramarines, Imperial Fists and Archangels have shitloads of descendants to call on in a crisis, the wolves are the sole embodiment of rough strength and drive. This hasn't helped their situation with Imperial institutions such as the Inquisition. 100 years to the day after the Emperor's internment on the Golden Throne, during a feast in the halls of the Space Wolves Fortress, Russ climbed upon a table to give a speech. He was stricken with a vision, and after standing there speechless for a few minutes, he fell to one knee, issued hushed orders to his retinue, and left. He left his sons with their first wolf flawed, Bjorn the fell handed, and a message. In the end, I will be there. For the final battle. For the wolf dinner time. And then the winds of change blew over the fluff once again. In the audio play parting of ways we get a slightly different version of events. There was still an annual feast, though it wasn't just to celebrate the day the Emperor got the snot beaten out of him by Horus, but also to commemorate the wolves that had died during the spring cleaning that followed the heresy, plus the completion of the Eat, the giant fortress of the Space Wolves. Also instead of a hundred years, it was two hundred years since the Siege of Terror, so unless Dawn was a really slow learner and not very bright and it took him over a hundred years to assemble the Golden Throne, that is a clear law change. Then again, given how Perturabo thoroughly kicked Dawn's ass in the Iron Cage, forcing Bobby, G and the Ultra Smurfs to come and save Dawn's sorry ass, it's a possibility that Dawn just wasn't very bright. It's also a possibility that the Emperor got the Golden Throne from an old Ikea warehouse, which would explain why even a Primarch would have had trouble in figuring out how to put it together in less than a hundred years. Also Russ wasn't about to hold a speech. Instead he had at first partaken in the festivities but as the party grew sullen, Russ retreated, sensing, as Bjorn put it, a fell wind from beyond the mountains, bleeding through the cracks of the fang. After clenching the table for a while, Russ clambered to his feet on the table, screaming no more. The shout silenced the space wolves in their brawling and made the flags of the smoke-filled halls tremble, so Russ apparently also had a gift for speech. Plus he had a gift for getting instantly sober as Bjorn described his face going from being ruddy flushed with Mjod to looking like an ice spectre. Russ then held the following kicker's speech. We come here to celebrate the old father, we come here to remember his sacrifice and his ascension from the world of the senses and his victory over my brother the traitor. We remember the dead, who even now gather in the oververse, their blade sharp, their aim keen. They are better than we are for they perished in the war to end all the wars and their souls have been purified. And what of us those left behind, wallowing in the drinks the fallen gods have left us. We have grown fat, we have the beast within us, but it has never yet been mastered. Then Russ paused to grab his drinking horn and held it aloft and continued, so let us celebrate my father's ascension, let us remember what he was able to accomplish, let us remember what he built and what he foresaw and then what he lost and how he failed. Do not mourn the fact that he no longer walks among us, for the galaxy was too small to accommodate such a soul, he was of an age of gods. And we are slumped in an age of mortals. 
The lights of the stars will fade. This place will grow old and the eyes will crack it. We will forget no matter how much the scalds tell the old tales. What battles are left for us like the ones before? My fallen brothers are gone. Malkada is gone. The leeches cluster around the golden throne and whisper of deeds done before they were born as if it were they who achieved them. Right double quotation mark. At this point Russ looked and steady on his feet and his eyes went glassy. Aid out of all of this, one thing remains true. We were not on terror. We were not there when the palace fell and that shame will pursue us for eternity. Right double quotation mark. Then Russ dropped his drinking horn on the board and then started to speak not to his warriors, but to himself or to some presence that was unseen. It remains unfinished. I have waited for too long, building this mountain, squabbling with Gilliman. I will not grow old, feeble, limping around a crumbling inheritance. I have an oath to keep, there are beasts left to slay. At this point Russ was fully immersed in his premonitions and he looked around the room. A smile dancing on his fanged face, seeing things from either long ago or yet to come. Listen closely my brothers, there shall come a time far from now, when the chapter itself is dying and our foes shall gather to destroy us. Then, my sons, I shall listen for your call, in whatever realm holds me and come I shall, no matter what the laws of life and death forbid. At the end, I will be there. For the final battle. For the wolf time. Then Russ gave the mustering signal and he and his retinue left, though as Bjorn made to follow only to have Russ turn towards him saying a single sentence, not you. When Bjorn asked for an explanation all Russ did was repeat the words, not you. Then he left. It is theorized that Russ like Magnus had the gift of premonition and knew that Bjorn would be needed in the years to come as the first great wolf, as it is heavily implied that if Bjorn hadn't been persuaded to take the mantle of great wolf, the chapter itself would have fallen apart in the absence of Russ. More likely Russ just didn't want Bjorn's moodiness to poison whatever adventure he was on. His helmet eventually came to be in the possession of Ulrich the Slayer. As to where Russ went and what happened to him there's a few theories given. Russ sought the lion out to make amends of their old feuding, if so they both forgot to tell both their chapters about it. That he fought in eternal combat with the resurrected cadaver of Horus. No that would be a badan's task and he completely owned that clone of Horus. That he searched for the tree of life to heal the emperor's soul. That he is trapped within a hollow star and tormented by his old adversary Magnus. Since Siege was able to trap Sigma in another dimension. Trapping Russ in a hollow star and have his star pupil Magnus use him as a punching bag makes as much sense as anything. That he is actually searching for Magnus, to finish the last task given to him by the Emperor and arrest his wayward brother. That he passed beyond the bounds of space and time and now roams among the gods, ready to return when needed accompanied by the fallen of his legion sundered in a paradise of warriors, so basically he's in the age of Sigma at this point? Somebody put him out of his misery, that's not a paradise that's hell on earth. That he's simply lost in the galactic fjord known as the warp and has been playing drunken pranks on demonic villagers for 10,000 years. TG theorizes that Lemon Russ may return as Horo, implying Horo isn't just one of Lemon's many, many bastard children growing up on some shithole feudal world. Magnus actually know where Russ is now, but he don't tell it even to his trusted sorcerer lords. The 13th company, and a figure bearing the likeness of Russ was spotted during the 13th crusade and the siege of the capital of Cardia. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.